I'm Emily Jones, I'm an Associate Professor at the Blavatnik School of Government and we're hosting a series of uh, commentaries and discussions on COVID-19 and public policy responses around the world. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Stefan Dercon, my colleague at the Blavatnik School, who's Professor of Economic Policy and was until recently Chief Economist at the UK's Department for International Development. Um, Stefan, thanks for joining us. Well, oh, I'm very glad to be here. It's great to have you. So you've been reflecting on the challenges that the current crisis is posing for developing country governments. Um, and the dilemmas they're grappling with. And as you note in a recent memo, policy making is as hard as it possibly can be with all the uncertainty around COVID-19. Um, could you just elaborate for us the broad sweep of issues that developing country governments are having to grapple with at the moment? No, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, for, for most developing countries, uh, when you look at the data, it doesn't appear that there are this massive number of cases that we observe, say, in Europe or in the U United States or earlier in China. You know, they are grappling with the possibility of a big public health crisis. They may be underreporting it, but most indications are that they are largely grappling with the possibility of a, of a health crisis. Meanwhile, by the encouragement that they get all over the world to do certain types of measures, they are having already an economic crisis. And an economic crisis in a developing country is very different from a crisis that you have in a rich economy that um, with a switch, one switch can put in billions into the economy and has the mechanisms to put in massive amounts of resources that can pick up, like in the UK, a quarter of the workers suddenly on the government's payroll without any real deep worry and thinking, well, one day we'll sort this all out. In a developing country, they don't have the resources, they don't have the means to act, and they have a lot of people that live essentially hand to mouth, who have very little savings, have very few reserves, small firms have virtually no reserves. And so actually, this is an economic crisis now playing out in a lot of small businesses, in a lot of households all over the developing world, while there is a risk for a public health crisis. And so that creates a very different atmosphere and actually probably an even harder way for them to react because all the information that comes is around the public health part. They're facing, facing huge uncertainty in terms of thinking, no, no, but meanwhile, I actually need to find a way of not letting my economy or my society collapse. And I think that's the really hard thing that they're facing with. And I do think policymaker making in that kind of countries is even worse. I was the other day, only a, kind of a week ago, I was approached, in fact, after writing the blog, by the finance minister of Myanmar. So we ended up spending a couple of hours talking through what he was trying to do as a kind of response plan. And I kept on asking, what do you know? And he said, I don't know anything. I have no information, really. I have to try to listen to what other people tell me, picking up a few ideas from outside, and I'm trying to put something together. Meanwhile, everybody expects me to do something dramatic. Yeah, that's and a so, illustration yeah. of just how tough the situation is, right, for developing country policymakers at the minute. And so what's your advice to someone like your the colleague finance minister in Myanmar? I mean, you've, in your blog, you talk a lot about no regrets policies. So the measures, I guess, that governments can take now that they're not going to regret in the future. But can you just talk us through what you mean by that? And then we could probe a little bit into the various aspects of those different policy areas. Look, you know, you, when you're faced with so much uncertainty, you know, you, you, you will want to do, you will want to do actions that afterwards, you're not going to be too worried about. That whatever situation occurs then, you can still be proud of that you've done. Now, I'm not saying that's the only actions you need to take. You still need to do all kinds of other things. But if you have to prioritize, let's at least do those things that either when the situation turns out not to have been as bad as you thought it would have been, or if the situation turns out in economic terms or public health terms even worse than you thought now it would be, that in all these kinds of scenarios, you've actually still done the right thing. And so my advice to, to a finance minister in Myanmar is to ask yourself, do I at least do these things? And then I will need to do some other things as well, but make sure that those things that I can do now, that are definitely good whatever happens, let me make sure they do it and, and think through very carefully uh, what, they, what they could look like. And then over time, 
every time you have a bit more information, do some other additional things and keep on building on gradually up your policies rather than, which seems to be the urge today, deciding about everything now, massive amounts of commitment of funding, of which probably a huge part will not be very well spent if you're not careful. So, so take a little bit more time, use the lockdowns, these kind of extreme measures of actually doing, let's at least do those things I definitely need to do now, that I, whatever happens are right things to do. Take some other tough decisions, but make them as temporary as I can. And then over time, build up just the higher quality of policy making. So if we take that a practical issue area like public health, can we just talk a little bit through what the kind of no regrets policies might be? Because I guess a lot of the discussions focused on provision of ventilators and concerns that there aren't enough ventilators in developing countries. Um, but in that public health area, what, what are the sort of no regrets policies we might be thinking about? It's, it's really good that you pick up on this ventilator example because that's what got me really cross and that we really think there's something really going wrong in policy making. And it was actually, I saw on a support plan for the World Bank for Bangladesh and for Kenya, I saw ventilators as the first item. I saw then also all these tweets that Elon Musk is putting out and then Buhari, the Nigerian president, responding to it, please send me some ventilators, Elon Musk. And I think, you know, this is going totally wrong. Ventilators is almost a nice to have in a scene from developing countries. You know, the kind of thing that you say, look, you know, if we get as far as actually providing decent treatment in a hospital, we may be providing you some support. But actually, meanwhile, if we focus everything on the treatment of the, of the disease that it can't really be treated. We make the same mistake as we did actually during the epi Ebola epidemic, where most of the many initially went into building treatment facilities in West Africa. And so we had most of the money, and we're talking billions, was spent on building treatment facilities for a disease at that time we had no treatment for. Where in the end, we discovered Actually, we knew all along, but we started listening better to people in public health said, look, it's actually quite straightforward. You just need to make sure that you identify who has the disease, protect them and protect other people and make sure, meanwhile, that all the other services in terms of health keep on continuing. So what does it mean now? Very concretely, my big concern in public health is the collateral damage. In fact, we already start seeing it in a lot of countries that statistical officers bring out data on excess death. And they are substantially, and we're talking sometimes double, three times as much as the data of people that were tested on COVID and have died. So we actually started getting already a lot of collateral damage in the rest of the system. For example, take vaccinations. It was calculated that several hundreds of thousands of children will probably die in India if the current reduction in vaccination that we've observed in the last month would be continued for a year. So the collateral damage is really in the sense of keep your basic health services, those services that save most lives going. So that's the first one. What does that mean? In a developing country, it's vaccinations. It is antiretroviral uh, drug supplies in, in Southern Africa. It is nutrition support all over the poorest countries. It's basic humanitarian aid to people that are suffering from big, big disasters or displacement. It's that kind of thing that will actually save deathly lives. So in every country, keep your community health services going because that's what they do. That's not hospitals with ventilators. It's usually mobile teams that keep on going around and so on. And so just the first one. So the, to, just to be clear, the risk is that those resources are redeployed to sort of address COVID-19 and yeah. then we're, not, we're sort of shutting down those other really important yeah. life-saving yeah. public health measures. Right. And so indeed, if you can create your fiscal spending, I would say first actually boost these kinds of services rather than what we observe all the time is actually that they get withdrawn from, from, from uh, in, in terms of lockdown, these teams can't go out, or oh, why don't you be in the hospitals to treat COVID-19 patients? And that's actually what you really want to avoid. And Related so the, to it, go on. I was gonna say on the prevention side, presumably as well, just preventing the spread, there's obviously yeah. questions around sort of testing, but even we're all getting advice to wash hands. And presumably that's harder for some sort of segments of the population in developing countries than others. There must be other bits of the public health, even to stop the spread of COVID-19 that are vitally important. Yeah. 
And actually, this is, this is from helpful lessons we have again from Ebola. It was teams going out in the community that identified carefully who were the ones suffering from this disease and then providing them additional support, sorry, the families with additional support, making sure it, it, it didn't spread further. So in the language of COVID-19, that's about shielding and protecting the right populations. But thinking more about what protection means, it's providing them not simply or with a bit of a space, a cover to hide in, but actually providing them with basic support and so on. And again, that's community health workers, that's people going out. Um, you know, these we, we already start talking in most uh, richer economies about contract traces. These are community health workers. Make sure you put bring them out. They know what's happening in their community. If there are cases, advise them, help them with the advice to isolate. And if they... Um, and if there are no cases, make sure that you, you, you also report this further. And it actually leads maybe to a final thing there. It's, it's about information. It's about data. You know, one of the things that we are totally obsessed with, I was talking to actually a former student from, from, from uh, Blavatnik, who is now a finance secretary in a very small state in, in India, Meghalaya. And he, I was talking to him the other day, and he said, well, you know, at the moment we are a small state, we can still test everything but we won't have enough test kits once all the migrants are going to return and once all the migrants are going to be back i can't do this anymore with uh, with the full testing all the time so we need to just think very carefully but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't collect data you could collect symptomatic data and systematically make sure you know it so at least in countries where you don't have uh, massive capacity for testing in the way that who says is the the lowest um, the lowest error margin, still use anything you can, but systematically to build up data. You know, this is actually what we'd learned in Ebola in West Africa, that a combination of public health workers with data are the ones that we could do. Now, in any country, you can do that within the context of your health system. You know, do uh, community health workers, uh, have community health workers going out shield and protect in the best way that you can do within your resources, and then make sure you get the information centrally gathered. You'll do already much better. And then all other things that you can do on top of it, of course, you should then look for what you suggested already on, you know, hand washing and so on. I find it actually quite interesting. Even just in February, I was in the DRC in the area of Ebola. You know, these kind of S systems of hand washing can be quite straightforwardly set up, you know, where you have in several places in the city or in every time you come into a public building, there are hand washing facilities. And actually, these things can work as well. But you, you start not trying to copy what they do in a rich economy, but you're actually trying to do what actually you can do. And we do know that social distancing and hand washing and versions of it can be used anywhere. And so we must make sure that information keeps on flowing, flowing as well. And again, you won't regret it. Yeah, great. And then I think of just lessons, so South-South learning, right, is so important then. So the learning from West Africa across uh, other parts of uh, other developing countries. Absolutely. Great. You talked there very nicely about the public health. Perhaps we can move a little bit into vaccine development. And I'd like to take us on to just the economic policy responses, because obviously we're going to need a vaccine ultimately to get out of this. Um, and there were questions there about who develops the vaccine, who gets access to it, how it's rolled out and how we can quickly roll it out to just about everybody in the world who's going to can need that vaccine. Yeah. Yes. And, and look, there is a lot of attention being given to vaccine development now. A couple of months ago, nobody paid much attention. But fortunately, a lot of research teams and others had already started to think about it. So, so we are in unprecedented times in terms of, of vaccines. And it's one of these examples of no regret. You know, if we can get a vaccine, even if we get too many vaccines, nobody will regret that we'll have too many. At the moment, we just don't have one. So, so there's probably, again, kind of three kinds of things where we should pay attention to. Um, so the first one is actually making sure that as many of the potential candidates are actually funded to do the research, okay? So, you know, this is not a time to bet on the one front runner, even though actually Oxford is probably one of the front runners, but it's not the time to do this. It's actually a very sensible policy to actually spread the risk very widely. And in fact, that's already happening with public money and that's a good thing. But when we start looking at it from the point of view of from developing countries, two further big risks are emerging. And so the first one is, 
is that we have we know with vaccines. In fact, there was um, H1N1, a, a version of flu that happened in 2009, where something similar of vaccine development was happening. But once the vaccine was done, suddenly all supply, all the immediate supply was was uh, um, was bought up by high income countries. So you've got essentially a limited supply in the market, a price that were quickly pushed up and only high income countries could get access to it. So there is a real need now to boost dramatically the manufacturing of all these possible candidates. In fact, one of my proposals, and I'm very glad to see others have picked this up all the time, is to actually say, well, why don't we produce at scale many of the possible candidates even before we know whether they work or not? So that by the time we know that they work, we have at least a few that we can use. And so, so that's when people start talking about, we need to just encourage, for example, by paying manufacturers now to produce 100 million, 200 million, a billion doses of, of vaccines now, so that by say September, October, when some of these vaccine candidates will have clear results, whether they work or not, whether they save or not, that they actually can be applied very quickly at a very large scale. And then the last thing linked to it, only if we now encourage a massive scale of production, can we avoid that high income countries are going to grab them. And the best way to do that is to now have a global deal that incentivizes both this big manufacturing and an equitable sharing, at least for emergency use, of the early doses of the vaccines that become available so that we can avoid that richer countries scrap it all, and that we can already early on get the all health workers all over the world in rich and poor countries to be vaccinated, and then maybe vulnerable populations all over the world. And then gradually, you know, um, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who could probably be then the last in the queue to be vaccinated, but that at least the, those who are most vulnerable and most likely to catch the disease to actually get vaccinated first. But in an equitable deal, uh, in equitable way. In way, and there's some great lessons, I guess, that come out of the discussions around access to medicines that we had in HIV/AIDS and all the antiretrovirals. There's a lot of lessons been learned for the last 20 years on exactly yeah. how to provide that access. And generics companies, presumably, I know India's got a big generic sector, Brazil. So there's production capacity in the global south as well that can be ramped up. Yes, and that's actually the interesting thing is that you know actually the biggest vaccine producer in the world, Serum Institute of India. Uh, they already, with the vaccine that Oxford is developing, they've said, you look, with our own money, we're quite happily going to make by September 40 million. In fact, they could probably by the end of the year have a tenfold of that amount. All will still need all kinds of very careful discussions. I know there's a lot of people involved in the global deal conversations that say, let's actually work towards changing these incentives so that these companies don't just think about supplying the UK and the US market, but actually generally now take steps that early on they boost the capacity and the production of these vaccines, even if it involves some extra public money, so that actually we can fulfill this. And indeed, as you said, there are companies in India, in China, in South Korea, Indonesia, all over the world, in fact, that actually could produce um, doses of this vaccine with appropriate support now. And then they will be able to do in the autumn when the vaccines are available to help to get that scale in the world that is needed. Real thought provoking stuff there about vaccines and who gets access to them. I'd like to move us on to the third and sort of final part of the policy discussion, which is around economic policy responses. Because I know you've thought a lot in the past in particular about social safety nets. Um, and some of the economic challenges that governments in developing countries are grappling with are precisely how to support the economy through this and make sure that the poorest people or people living in poverty in, in these countries are not hit hardest and unable to bounce back. So would you elaborate there some of the sort of no regrets policies that you're thinking about might be useful on, econ on the economic recovery side? So, no, and, and, and absolutely, and you're absolutely right that the, these are some of the biggest challenges these countries are facing. And it's really hard, you know, because we don't really know in some of the countries whether, whether the public health disaster is really going to uh, take off. Meanwhile, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I, I'm thinking here of, a, you know, I was in touch with um, a, a big leather manufacturer in India. Yes, we know there is an issue there, definitely with the disease. But actually, you know, they 
really had still massive orders and tens and tens and tens of thousands of people dependent for their livelihoods to be able to do actually to commit these orders. If they can't fulfill these orders, they will definitely go bankrupt. And so you get this kind of real dilemma in terms of, you know, you have livelihoods of tens and tens of thousands of people, but you could also say, look, I will just want to close now and, and, and it all disappears. So how do you now deal with this? And it's a really hard one. It's probably one of the hardest one to do. Now, in terms of no regret, I don't know what I need to do directly with this leather factory, but I do know a number of things that I, that I know that you definitely can do. So then the first one I would say is that, you know, we all would like this crisis to be V-shaped rather than L-shaped. So that when we go down, that we don't stay down, but that we actually have V-shaped, that we can come out of it as well. Now, those who are most at risk for this crisis to be an L-shaped rather than a V-shaped are actually the poorest people. The smallest businesses, the micro enterprises, the, the casual wage workers and so on. They have virtually no reserves to, to fall back on. So my first no regret policy is in any case, if you have social safety nets that exist, add money into them. Try to expand them as quickly as you can. Don't worry as much about targeting today for the next couple of months than you usually would worry about. You know, the moral hazard and all these worries about they won't, will, won't be willing to work and so on, it's not there. Make them temporary, yes, but boost it now quite dramatically. That's definitely a no regret. Actually, in terms of the fiscal stimulus that, that or the fiscal cost in most of the countries, it's actually quite peanuts. This is virtually nothing. This is really fractions of a percent of GDP, maybe 1% of GDP or something that at most this would mean. Relative to some of the other measures proposed, this is nothing and given to the economic cost. You would want to do that now because if they lose all their assets, they will not bounce back. They have nothing there to bounce back with. They have no access to credit markets properly. They don't have any ways of actually uh, go back, back into work and it, it will disappear. So do that and be creative about it. <clears throat> if you have a mechanism to give an untargeted general transfer, very simply say geographically targeted, everybody living in a particular area of the city, they can get this kind of support. There's no big problem with it as long as you communicate carefully that it's temporary, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you boost and you boost as much as you can. Of course, it's also a great opportunity. Uh, I was talking in Myanmar to the finance minister, as I mentioned earlier. He actually said, look, actually, strangely enough, we have massive mobile phone penetration already and mobile payments has really taken off even into the rural areas. I said, look, this is your moment, you know, let them very quickly, very easily register for, uh, for a mobile payment and just send it to every mobile phone account in every small city, every rural area. You may not do it in the places, in the geographies or the mass that the rich people are using, but you can do a bit of targeting. And so they're really looking to it and say, okay, we haven't really done that before, but let's do it now. And so we imagine we can do things we haven't done really before and just try out whether this could be a real move for their economy as well. The next thing though is actually harder. And that's then the more the things to do with the economy itself and the business and so on. My best advice there is, is don't do anything you can't reverse. And anything you can delay a little bit delays until you have more information. So I would actually say in all these schemes of, and we've seen in countries, they do, or they, they basically, oh, you don't have to pay taxes this year. Well, that's a mistake. Why don't you do a tax moratorium? And then get time and say, you don't have to pay them now, but we may well still charge them in six months. And then you can be a bit more discriminatory that middle classes may still pay some of it and the poorest people don't, or something like that. The so risk there that you're trying to preempt is if you say you no need to pay taxes this year, then it's just become the new norm that everybody decides they're not going to pay taxes ever exactly. again. Exactly. We had a, a fascinating conversation with an important advisor to, to the South African president. And she said, and she emphasized very strongly, that was their biggest fear. South Africa has done a big package, but in the nurture of the political economy of the country, she was very worried that it will be very hard to reverse all that support. I mean, we also going to get crazy support. There's all going to be national airlines that probably were already in bankruptcy proceedings before 
before it started or should have been, suddenly will be flying around at incredible cost. And so we let me not name them, but I can definitely name several developing countries that actually were in the process of selling them off or having to close them down. They will be flying again at massive cost because they, they now will be built out. The same will apply with utilities, some of sometimes some of the worst run organizations in many countries, hotbeds of corruption. Massive amounts of money will be pumped in, and now they have uh, um, an, an excuse to do so. So that's what I worry about. That's why I'm much more cautious on what we do with the economy. Those who shout it loud, shout loudest, those who are most connected with the politicians, they will get the money. And that will mean it will not easily be sustainable afterwards. And I'm finally developed yeah, as well, looking at somehow some of the dynamics playing out in the in the UK and US and other places. Can exactly. I just on the macro yeah, well. financing picture? Because we've heard a lot about the need for so developing countries that are particularly constrained on both the sort of fiscal side, just how do they raise the money for this? We've seen an outflow of capital from a lot of uh, developing countries at the moment, the time when they they most need it. Um, so we've. There's been discussions about debt rescheduling, debt relief, and that's kind of grabbed the headlines about how best to help developing countries at the minute. Um, what's your thoughts on just how to balance the books and finance this and what role the debt rescheduling should play? It's, debt relief is such an easy rallying call. It's also like a bit like uh, it, it doesn't recognize, um, first of all, that it doesn't immediately give you an awful lot of cash. And secondly, lots of countries actually, their debt is structured in ways that it is not anymore from the kind of lenders that used to be the, you know, the Paris Club and related things. So it's a far more complex area now than it is. I worry actually a little bit that the whole appeal for debt relief takes um, or distracts us now. I would definitely be in, form, in favor of a debt moratorium. And in fact, it should be widespread. And, and we would not just be from IFIs, but should be also from bilateral donors, hopefully from China, and indeed from commercial lenders as well to these countries. A debt moratorium is the sensible thing to do. But then let's actually take stock. What is the best way of using our scarce global resources to help uh, those countries that need it most and those countries that um, have no alternatives to actually stimulate the economy to do it. So, look, I'm, I want to be cautious again for similar reasons of, of you know, if we, if, we, if we rush it too much, we're going to spend on all kinds of things that we probably shouldn't really be spending it on. But it doesn't mean, I mean, there should be no country at this moment that actually should get in trouble because it has to start paying uh, interest on its, on its debt. That's obviously clear. But let's, let's slowly take that. Uh, and, and stake that over time. I, I'm sure there will be debt relief at some point, but mm. let's actually be sensible and clever about it, that mm. we do it in ways that stimulate the recovery best, rather than this idea, oh, we'll wipe that off, but otherwise nothing else is happening. Okay. Because there's some countries... So so the debt moratorium, so immediate suspension of payments to give a little bit of space, but then actually think about re debt restructuring, debt relief, is there a sort of a longer term, complicated discussion that we should sort of postpone for now in order to yeah. focus on the immediate response? Right. And, and, and yes, and, and, and exactly right, because, you know, we, we, we otherwise risk an, an, another problem that already some countries should be very cautious with, mm -hmm. which is very quickly rushing in all kinds of decision, almost with this idea, and it will, it will be debt relief later on. So we shouldn't have, we shouldn't worry at all about it. Now, I'm not trying to say countries shouldn't spend now. They should spend now. But again, let's do this actually cautiously and a little bit over time. Let's actually find lenses like no regrets or other lenses to prioritize now so that we don't have to regret later on that we have actually spent maybe, you know, the equivalent of 10% uh, extra debt to bailing out an, uh, an airline that in the new state of the world, yeah. maybe with, not, with far fewer uh, planes in the air and, and airports closing or whatever, that may not actually be able to pick up again. You know, this is not a moment for, for doing that kind of spending. And I worry a bit with the debt relief discussion we create a bit of a, a situation where we don't really have to think about what we today do with our, with our money. And I want everybody to be focused on. 
I understand it, of course, you know, that is a big worry for quite a lot of countries. Of course, a lot of, say, poor African countries were already getting into medium or high risk of this death stress beforehand. Yeah. And, uh, and it's nothing to do in itself with COVID. So again, should we punish a prudent country that didn't really borrow that much on the international markets um, uh, by getting now fewer resources to get the recovery relative to some other ones that didn't spend wisely? You know, these are complicated questions. Let's actually think carefully around it. And there is this is this, they, and they actually have aspects of uh, redistributive justice yeah. um, uh, in, in, in it as well. Resources post COVID will still be scarce. They will not just be endless. Mm -hmm. Let's at least give us a bit of room to spend and best for the best of people uh, and developing countries across the world. It sounds like with the no regrets policies, there's a series of issues that are relatively low cost, like public health, where we can move at relatively low cost with pretty big impact or social safety nets and rolling those out. And then there are some really big economic, potentially very costly decisions that don't really need to be taken now and can be deferred and actually might be the regretted ones later. Um, so it's a very helpful framework for thinking through. Just one last lesson for us to conclude. What would you, what's the thought that you would leave uh, policymakers around the world who are grappling with this, what's the one thing you would want to say to them at the moment? Well, you know, in some way I sent them my love, you know, and my respect, <laughs> because I don't think they've ever faced a harder time for decision making. Mm. You know, we love to lecture them as academics about rational decision making. This is now really, really hard. Yes, we can criticize some that they didn't prepare as hard as they could. But, you know, I, I wrote a book on disaster preparedness. I will admit that in February, I was underestimating it, even though I was given data by the medical faculty here that were in the end became the Imperial College modeling of the kind of consequences they had. And I thought also, surely it won't be as bad. And I had this usual optimism bias that I didn't really do the things. And so, you know, first of all, it's this important lesson of how, how hard it is to prepare properly. And we should not just tell everybody off that they didn't prepare and X did and, and Y did. I think it was a bit of luck for a lot of countries involved that actually managed to do the right decision at the right time. But we should invest much more. So the thought definitely is learn about preparedness and how hard it is and how important it is. The second thing is, it's actually about how do you deal with uncertainty? My thought there is very much is that you know, you want to, over time, find ways of lifting the veil of uncertainty. So make sure the first thing you do in a crisis like this, you set your data systems up. Because only data will rescue you over time from the uncertainty you have. Look, we've learned it the hard way in the UK by not testing for a while. And we've learned, we're learning it all over the world in that sense. So this is now. This is what you will really need to do. And then be willing to adapt and to learn. Because this is a time for making mistakes and correcting them. Mm. The problem is at times politicians never want to actually say they got it wrong and they need to change their mind. This is a time to be able to say, I was wrong, I need to change my mind. But like Keynes said, you know, when the facts change, I change my mind. And that leads to the final thing. The final thing is about, is the hardest thing about policymaking at the, at the moment is keep the trust of people. Mm. And that requires massive investment in careful communication. You usually, tri usual tricks don't work. Look at Mr. Trump. He has to actually suddenly learn a very hard lesson that he has to actually think once in a while what he's, about what he says, because actually it can backfire much more. Communication and trust are the central attributes of, of getting us out of this crisis properly. The countries where trust will be lost will be much longer in this kind of crisis than those places where policymakers can actually do this. So that's I, I would leave it with that. Let's build as much trust as we can. Communication is the key part. Brilliant. Stefan Derken, thank you so much. Really insightful conversation we've had with you today. Much appreciated. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. <laughs>